Lisa, you've told me something uh, privately, which I'm going to talk about publicly, um, that you call a feminist philosophy of science. Now, I know what feminism is, and I know what philosophy, and I know what science is, and I know what philosophy of science is, but I do not know what feminist philosophy of science is. <laughs> well, feminist philosophy of science is t doing philosophy of science from, from a feminist perspective or using feminist heuristics. And by heuristics, I mean frameworks uh, guiding as guidelines for model type building or model building. So using um, feminist values or feminist, if you will, biases to help you build new models or to complement the models that are already there. So the models that are already there for, for example, how people have sex together um, in heterosexual couples, um, are basically based on having the man have an orgasm. And then if she has an orgasm, well, good, but uh, <laughs> not necessarily so. Um, and um, the classic model of heterosexual sex is foreplay, male penetration, and uh, over. Um, <laughs> and um, what people have noticed, especially women, is that uh, in that sequence, female orgasm is not likely to happen. Um, unless uh, uh, somebody stimulates her clitoris while she has intercourse. Um, so uh, with uh, work that was spurred on by a demand in my book, that the sexology community find out for the first time what the statistics are on lesbian frequency of orgasm. Uh, results from that research have unspooled this very large set of research into what are called, um, uh, well, they call them male scripts or heterosexual scripts. Um, that are sociological entities, obviously, heterosexual scripts and male-oriented scripts of how people have sex. And the, the order that I just gave you is a heterosexual male-oriented script oh. of how to have sex, oh. right? Uh -huh. So yeah. when it came sounds out... Fam sounds familiar. Yeah, <laughs> and, and when it came out that um, from the research responding to my book to get a statistically sound. The book, The Case of the Feminist. The, 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 the orgasm feminist. book, yeah. Um, I demanded in that book to find out a statistically robust ra rate of female um, orgasm among lesbians. Um, there are two studies that it turns out I was both involved with, Garcia et al. 2014 and Frederick et al. 2017. And we found out there, Garcia, Lesbians have 10% more orgasms than any other women. And Frederick, between uh, 21 and 26% more orgasms than any other women. Mm. That, <laughs> and the sexology community sat up and said, holy smokes, how's that happening? What, what are they doing that nobody else is doing? <laughs> and so all these studies were launched saying about technique. Now, one of our studies, the Frederick et al. study, was a study of technique. It studied 30 techniques that were used, and it determined that there's three magic things that you can do that are the most effective combination of things to have women orgasm. They are deep kissing, genital touching, and genital stimulation, and oral sex. What's missing from that? Penetration. Yeah. Um, now the the did woman. Did I get the right answer? Yes, you did. And the 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 journalist who wrote this up for the Guardian called that the golden trio, right? Anyway, that was our answer. But all these other studies were also done simultaneously and and later on and on and on. So that paper was in 2017. They've been doing studies ever since to discover what is it that lesbians are doing that heterosexual women could do with their men that could have the heterosexual women have as many orgasms as the lesbians are obviously having <laughs> without them. <laughs> and 
uh, so it launched a whole uh, new project yeah. in sexology. And so this is, uh, to generalize it, a, a, a feminist uh, way of orientation That's right. in, the, in the structural design of science to determine things. So, I mean, I, I, I would have never thought that uh, ab initio, but I can understand that. My That's question, what I call feminist philosophy yeah, of science. Right. Now, my question is, is that a unique sui generis case because it has to do with female orgasm and very female, or is it generalizable about other aspects of, of women's health or other kinds of areas that a feminist approach would also be significant? Or is this a unique, uh, uh, isolated case? No, it's actually not unique. For example, my, my uh, colleague, Alison Wiley, who ha also has an archaeology degree as well as a philosophy PhD, she went and challenged the archaeologists to reanalyze their data, breaking it into genders. Oh, oh. And that included bone data and analysis okay. of diet mm. and so on. When they did that in a particular uh, set of South American bones, they discovered <laughs> that not only were the men and women on completely different diets right. oh. and living in completely different places. Interesting. So the society was structured totally differently than anyone had ever realized before. Interesting. And if you didn't have that bifurcation, that, that feminist approach to saying right. that, that there is this difference, you would have never discerned that. That's right. You know, you, you've almost convinced me. I, I, I'm now a, a, a feminist philosophy of science acolyte. <laughs> I started out 10 minutes ago and I, w I was a skeptic. Now I'm an acolyte. You're, you're a magician. You're so kind. Thank you for listening, Robert. <laughs>